2 Kings, I'm going to read one verse. Uh, verse 14. And he, he being Elijah, took the mantle of Elisha that fell from him and smote the water and said, Where is the God of Elisha? And when he also had smitten the water, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you, God, for the honor to preach, thanking you for the word of God, thanking you, God, that you're the God of the Old Testament, you're the God of the New Testament, you're the God of the day, and you're the God of the morrow. And Father, I pray this morning that the word of God would not go out void, that it be an encouragement to some of your people. And Father, that uh, Lord, in the times in which we live, uh, whether it's governmental times or whether it's just the time where each individual is in their life or God whether it's the time we are as a country or as a church help us God to realize that this too will come to pass and God help us to realize one day this thing will be folded up like a towel and we'll be gone but God I pray you'd help us to realize most of all what we have in thee what we have in a savior in Jesus Christ and what we have in the body of Christ what we have in the church and what we have in the Holy Spirit of God. Father, I pray you bless what's said and done in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, here's the story of, of Elijah's death, or Elijah's taken away, not necessarily his death. And there's a lot to, you know, to be said about Elijah and, and the fact that he didn't die. And some say he might, he's still going to die. And there's a lot there that we won't get into. Uh, but anytime there's a transition in life, there's there's always... Uh, you're always, you know, I heard an old preacher say, one of, one of my mentors, he said, you're either in a storm, getting ready to go in a storm, or coming out of a storm. That's just called life. But here Elijah had been with Elijah for a long time. Uh, if you know the story, you know your Bible, Elijah was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he was the 12th. So he was the last one in the 12 yoke of oxen. He was the one that was you know, supposed to do it right, finish the job, and then along come Elijah, and Elijah said, come follow me. And he said, well, let me go say goodbye to mom and dad, and Elijah just, you know, went on. But but he, he killed and offered the yoke of oxen and the tools upon an altar. So what is that? That's a significance of him leaving everything that he had to go follow Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become more are become new. Here, you got Elijah dying, and up in verse uh, 9, Elijah asked Elisha, and it came to pass that when he had gone, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. That was his, that was his ask. Now, it's, I was thinking about this this morning as we, we've got an extra hour sleep. Sheila and I are getting old now, so we go to bed early. But, you know, Solomon had everything and asked for wisdom. Elisha has nothing. Right? He's a prophet. He has, I'm not being that bad. But yet he asked for power, a double portion. This verse is very significant for me. I wasn't raised in church I was born and raised in a tobacco farm in Grand Slick, Kentucky. I wasn't, wasn't ever raised in church, and I got saved when I was 20 years old. Uh, I, you know, I believe that when I was 20 years old, first time I was under conviction, because I'd never been around preaching. I didn't know right from wrong, or well, I didn't right from wrong is different. I knew, but I didn't know anything spiritually. Uh, and then I got saved, and, and I had a, a great uncle, uh, Ed Mays. He's a little bitty old fella. They were the old regular Baptist church. He smoked about three pack cigarettes a day, and and he had been divorced, so he couldn't be ordained. Uh, so I wanted my uncle Ed to baptize me, but he wasn't allowed, you know. And but the, but they let the old man. He's an old man. Now, he'd been dead for, you know, almost twenty five years. So he was an old man then. And and as we went down into the baptismal that morning, uh, at the bottom of the old regular Baptist church, uh, they asked Uncle Ed to pray. And I was standing in the baptismal. You know how you, how you do it. Because everybody will come to a baptism, right? Kentuckians will. So most of my family was there. And, and we were all heathen. We didn't, you know, we didn't know much. And Uncle Ed prayed. And I remember Uncle Ed praying, God given a double portion. Now, I couldn't, I didn't know Elijah from Elisha. I couldn't have found 1 Kings from 
the Wall Street Journal right then, right? I didn't know anything. But I remember distinctly that old man praying for God to give me a double portion. You know, and, and you think about, everybody says how wise Solomon was. Well, look how wise Elisha was. Because he knew what he needed. Now, you think about Elisha, the duty that he had following Elijah for a long time. All that he saw, all that he had he got. So we see his duty, and here we see his desire. His desire was to have a, a double portion. I wonder today if, if, if you had your prayer, not a genie, not a wish, because even Elijah said, I don't know that you'll get it or not. He said, you've asked a hard thing. You know, if you study out the Bible, they say, if you count them, Elijah did 14 miracles and Elisha did 28, exactly twice, double, right? So here he says, you've asked a hard thing, but... If, you know, you, you see me taken away, God's granted it. So his desire was to give me a little more than what you got. Most of us spend more time worrying about what God has assumed to do for somebody else than being appreciative of what God's done for us. There's always going to be seemingly somebody else that has been in more favor with God. I can tell you I believe that that's really not true. I believe it appears true because a lot of times we're unthankful for what God's done for us and we don't spend enough time counting our blessings and what God's done for us. I mean, you know, I'm 54 years old. If I had to stop and sit and write all the things that God's done for me, I doubt if I could pin them all down. You know, what you see now, whether you like it or you don't like it, it's a far cry from what God found 34 years ago. And, and, and a lot of times we, we look, and even as preachers, you know, we've read all the books. I love missionary books, and I see. But, but when, you, when you read, you understand, you know, well, there's a, why can't I have the God of George Mueller or the God of Jonathan Edwards? Or the God of Brother Foster, or Brother Sammy. I talked to Brother Sammy for a little while yesterday. You do have the same God they got. Right? And, and, and God cares, if you're born again, God cares as much about you as He does any of those. But a lot of times, because we look at our circumstance as a tragedy instead of a triumph of what God's trying to do for us and in us, we look at all the things that could be perceived as bad things. But the Bible says, all things, all, right? I mean, we're not, we're not Calvinist. Whosoever shall call upon the name. Whosoever means whosoever, and all means all. You know, and even, you know, even when we screw up in life, God is so good, and God is so caring, that he'll take our complete disaster not saying that it's God's will now, but he'll take our disaster and make it the absolute best that it could be in the circumstances wherein it's in. All right? I'm not saying God blesses sin, God blesses stupidness, and I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that God is just like you as a father or as a mother. We, you know, when your kid disappoints you or breaks your heart, or disrespects you, or whatever they do, you're long-suffering to those kids. Now, in the heat of the moment, you might just say, I'm done, you know, get your stuff and get out. But unfortunately, they never do, right? They just keep coming back. But if we can be that with our kids, even though we're disappointed, right? As, as kids grow to teenagers in the early 20s, and, you know, your anger and your frustration and your disappointment meeting their anger and their frustration and their disappointment, this leads to a bomb. So one, one, one little word that somehow God taught me, I learned, as kids become adults, I'm sure disappointed in your action. Now, disappointment doesn't mean you don't love them. Doesn't mean you don't have, I don't know, some of you parents struggling with this. You know, thank God if we're an empty nester, man, they're on their own. But it doesn't mean you don't care it means you're disappointed in the decision that they made. And guess what? They need to understand sometimes the decision that people made leads to disappointment. See, you know, a lot of times, certainly as, as Baptists, a lot of times we make really big statements. 
that we or our family or our spouse are not willing to back up. Well, if my kid ever, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden your kid does, right? Let me help you. If you're worth anything, if your kid ever, you're going to do your best to help him through it. You're going to do your best to love him. You're going to do your best to show him that, you know, sometimes when you run on rocks, you fall and scrape your knees. And because, listen, we all walk with crooked feet. So we see for, for years and years and years, Elisha had been dutiful to Elijah. And then here at the, I mean, think about it. I mean, there's a, as long as there's somebody else in front of you, you're sort of good. Right? I mean, as long as there's Elijah trailblazing, you know, and taking all the shots and taking all the bullets, but then all of a sudden now it's, it's my time. So ask what you will. He said, I'd like to have a double portion of thy spirit. <laughs> Say, why? I believe he's afraid. I believe he's scared because, wow. <laughs> He's sort of been leading, and I've just been following, and this second chair has been a pretty good chair, and everything's sort of okay, and now it's all of a sudden I'm going to be the man. I need more help. Have you ever put your desires in front of God? Not, not your lottery desires, okay? I mean, you know, I mean, a Corvette's an okay desire to put in front of God. I've put that in front of him several times. But, you know, but, but God... How might I serve you? God, what might you do with me? I mean, we all, you know, if you read you know, over in the book of Corinthians, we all can't be preachers. You know, and we all can't be deacons, and we all can't be pastors. But what's your little piece of, of what God wants you to be? Wherein you're at? What's your desire for God? The Bible says, he that desire the office of a bishop desireth a good thing. There's some good things to desire. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, there's just, you know, God, you know, let us do this and let us do that. But if he put it here, he puts it in front of Elisha. And Elijah don't say a whole lot when Elisha says, hey, I give me. He said, that's a hard thing. But yet he sees Elisha taken and he sees God grant his desire and the mantle fall. And he picks up the mantle and he runs down to the Jordan River. And then I believe the next thing we see when he asks the question, where is the God of Elijah, is we see doubt. You know why I think he went straight to the river? To see if this thing's going to work. <laughs> now, I'm just practical, right? I mean, you ask God for something, and all of a sudden you see it, and he's thrilled that the mantle falls, and he runs, picks it up, and now there's doubt. It's amazing how much as Christians you and I doubt. When we know all the scriptures... You know, everybody wringing their hands about the election. Now, I'm an American, so I want the election to go a certain way. But I'm also a Christian. I'm just hoping that God has mercy for four more years. That's why I'm a chicken. Right? right? But sooner or later, folks, if you read the end of the book, this thing's all got to come together in a different way. They got to get rid of folks that, you know, that believe the way we believe. Now, hopefully, God will get rid of us just an instant before they get rid of us. But, you you know, you you think about it. Sooner or later, somebody's got to bring them all under one. The Bible says peace, 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 right? Sooner or later, it's got to get bad enough to where everybody will follow one. You know, so regardless of what happens, God's still God. But here he asked God and God delivered and then there's doubt of God are you really? You know like when you you get married or or like when you answer the call or there's something big going on in your life the doubt always comes. The devil's a liar. The devil's a liar and he'll cause you to doubt and here I believe he calls Elisha to doubt. And he asked the question where is the God of Elijah? Well, where was he? He was right there. But yet we always ask those questions. At least I do. I and mean, you're all probably more spiritual than I am. But it's amazing how self-talk, you know, the world, the flesh, the devil, I don't know which one it is. I think most of the time my biggest problem is me. And then, you know, if I get any kind of victory over me, the devil piles it on, but most of the time it's just me fighting with me. But yet, where is the God of, well, he's still here. You know, where is the God of Moody, the God of Sunday, the God of Graham? He's still here. 
He's still God. And he's been so much better to you than you realized. You know, there in the Old Testament, you know, one of the prophets, and they get afraid, and, 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 and the young prophet's afraid, and said, man, we're going to die. And he just said, God, open his eyes and let him see. Sometimes we just need to open our eyes and see. You know, everybody's, you know, worried about, you know, the pandemic and them shutting it down and them doing this or them doing that. Whatever they do, they do. Okay? Now, whatever we do about it, that's what we do about it. But they're going to do what they're going to do. It's going to be okay. You ain't never went hungry. It's going to be okay. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in the food business. It's going to be fine. There's plenty of food. But he asked the question, where's the God of Elijah? And I'm afraid a lot of times we ask that question. Because we don't think God cares about us the way he cares about others. And if you're a Christian, that's not true. Now, if you're not lost, the Bible says that God's angry with the wicked every day. Right? And, and so, but, but if you're a Christian, God's still God. And God wants more of you than probably you're willing to give. And God desires you to ask the same type question, give me a double portion. And that's not, you know, two Big Macs instead of one, right? A double portion of your spirit. You know, we're, we're, we're so worried about theologically being correct that we're afraid to pray for the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And folks, those are the things that guide and direct what we do. So he runs down to the river and says, where is the God of Elijah? And then he <laughs> smotes the river thinking, oh, God, let this thing work. That's what he was thinking. I believe God. That's what he was thinking. <laughs> Why? Because he had doubt. Because no matter how dutiful you've been, or no matter what kind of desire you have, the good desires in life, there's always doubt that God will do it for you. But I asked the question this morning, why is there doubt? I, I, I wonder truly this week if you would take and and write down where you're at. And write down some of you that's, that's lived, you know, 40 years. Write down where you thought you would have been if you were writing this 10 years ago. And I'll bet you God's been better to you than, certainly been better to you than you deserve. But I'd be willing to bet God's been better to you than you ever imagined. Right? Now, I, listen, folks, die. Death comes. That's just that's the that's the curse of a sinful, damnetic world, right? So you know, I mean, we were you know my you know we we you look at things and you watch death do things to different people. Death hurts. I mean, you know, I mean, it's I mean, it's just and preacher, why? Sometimes you don't know why, but but God's been God's been really good. But sometimes you got to go to the river and ask the question. But you got to be willing to smack the river to see what God will do. A lot of these live in doubt with ever putting feet of, feet of faith on what you've asked God to do. Him smacking the river with the mantle is, a, is simply a way of putting feet to the faith of the prayer where which he had prayed. This thing won't work or not. A lot of times Christians want to do, want to do, want to do, want to do, and I wish God, and I wish God, and I wish God, and God's not the problem. The Bible says, David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. A lot of us have a desire to see that the Lord's good, but yet you won't taste and see that the Lord's good. You won't, you won't step out by faith in just anything. So we say faith, we automatically contribute that to money. No, faith is whatever little world you're wrestling with, and whatever little things God's saying, won't you just trust me with it? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. We have a we have a lady that we oftentimes go see in seminars and she always quotes it backwards. Life and death's in the power of the tongue. So my wife quotes it backwards. But the Bible says that death and life is in the power of the tongue. The negative is always first. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. So a lot of times our molly grubbing doesn't necessarily bring upon us what we don't want. Our molly grubbing will keep us from truly asking and trusting by faith what we really do want. 
Now, I don't, I don't know all of your individual circumstances this morning at all. But I'd be willing to bet a large majority really doing okay. So how come we just can't be thankful because we're doing okay? You know, my, my, my wife, you know, asked me, how you doing, how you doing, how you doing? I'm probably doing better than I've ever done in my life. I'm doing okay. No, is there problems I can tell you about? Sure. I mean, watermelon, I can tell you about lots of problems. But it's just life. But at the end of the day, God's doing really, really good by us. But if we can understand that being dutiful and having a desire then getting past our doubt can lead us to some amazing dreams inside of Christ, that'd be really good. But boy, that doubt. God could never use me. You know, what about this? And what will they say? Who cares? I mean, right? And I'm not being flippant. I don't believe you should. You know, I don't believe you should, you should run your failures or your sin down the throat of other people, but also don't believe it should stop you from doing what God's asked you to do. You know, when you think about who God uses, well, I mean, read through your Bible. You know who God uses? God uses those that are willing. You know, and when you go into the little convenience store, you might be the only Christ that person sees. You just slip them a track. How you doing? I'm doing really good. Or you just don't talk. I, out of all the things COVID related, it really hasn't affected my life a whole lot at all. I don't wear a mask. I don't care. Uh, I guess the biggest thing is the person-to-person -person contact. I'm the guy that never goes through the drive-thru, right, because I like people. You know, I'm the guy, when you go to the bank, I go in, say hi, spread love, right, let everybody see me, and what a great day they've had now because they see me, right? <laughs> but COVID, you know, everybody's locked up, right? Uh, Jordan says in his basement, I'm thinking he's voting Democrat because he's in the basement, <laughs> right? Some of you all get that in a minute. There you go. Uh, but but, you, but you, you think about the opportunity that you have either to curse and complain, death in life and the power of the tongue, or say, I'm really doing okay. Because we, we really are. We're on the winning side. I've read to the back of the book. One of these days we're going to get called out of here. One of these days we're going to take our lick and jump sheet of Christ. And one of these days we're going to be the bride of Christ. One of these days we're going to come back and reign. Now listen, that's some pretty cool stuff. This thing's a long way over. I mean, this old world still got at least thousand seven years left, brother. It's a long way over. But the faith and the desire to get past the doubt. Is there a lot of doubt? There's probably more doubt right now than have been a long, long time. But come Wednesday morning or Friday morning or next Wednesday morning, whenever we wake up and find out really who our president is, it's still going to be okay. Why? Because I know who our God is. I mean, he's still on the throne. You know, and I mean, listen, I mean, there's our generation pretty much have had it better than any other generation, right? I mean, so that's when I say four more years of mercy, that's because I'm a coward and I just rather go. You know, the closer I can get to the end without any real trouble, I figure the better off I'll be. But if not, he's still on the throne. You're still on the winning side. I mean, we really are going to get to go to heaven. This thing is eternal. It's not just temporal, it's eternal. You know, in the next week or the next month or the next year, some of us won't be here. We'll be in eternity. Right? Maybe <laughs> all the believers won't be here next week. Amen. The rest of you can have church without us. We'll be out. But, but he asked the question, where is the God of Elijah? And unfortunately, we asked the question, God, why don't you do for me what you seem to do for them? I've lived long enough not to really ever desire to be in anybody else's shoes because I've had enough back behind the scenes to understand that even when life seems good, life ain't good. You know, there's people that you drive by their house or you drive by their things or they, their, their boat. My wife wants a boat and a lake house. I don't want either. 
their boat drives by you and God I wish I had that you might not wish you had the problems that was in the front seat amen right I mean you know the bigger the house the more it takes the heat right I mean it's you know I mean once you get so old that stuff really don't matter but yet why do the wicked seem to prosper well the rain falleth on the just and the unjust we can't look inside of the moment of time and divide up what's going on we have to have faith in what the book says and what God says but more than just faith we have to recognize what God's already done you know most of the time most of the time when you see me over here on the altar it's because I'm humbled of how good God's been to me because I'll sit back there and somebody will get to singing about how good God's been. Because I know me, see? I know me. I know the struggles from the time I can remember at four and five years old to the 54-year-old person that I stand before you today. I know me. I know the person God called to preach at J to 25 and couldn't read. I know the person that every promotion that he's ever gotten in his life, uh, up until the last two, he's had to learn to spell the title. And I sit over there, and somebody gets singing about how good God's been. That thing just eats me up. Because if anybody is ever undeserving, it's me. But God's just been good. God's been good in health, and God's been good in, in, in wealth. God's been good in friends. God's been good in church. Those of you that, that, are, that are visiting, this, you know, I know a lot about church. <laughs> I've preached all over the world. I've been in 19 different countries. I know a little bit about church. There's a reason we drive 40 minutes from California, Kentucky, because I really believe it's the best church around. And I don't say that, I mean in the, in the scope of a church. In the scope of, you know, I have no idea, you know, how much money we have, nor do I care, Right? I got no idea who's what, but I do know one thing. I know there's mercy, and there's kindness, and there's love, and there's not many heirs. You know, there's probably a few people putting on heirs, but I've seen lots of other places. You know, the, the last time I charted the church, started the church, I called it Bethesda because I wanted it to be a place, a house of mercy. I believe church should be a place where you can raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me because I'm struggling in the rest of the friggin' auditorium not worry about what your sin is. But yet most of our churches have gotten to the place where you can't raise your hand and just ask for personal prayer because everybody worry about what's the matter with you. But here it's a little bit different. For the most part, right? I mean, I realize, you know, maybe most of the hypocrites have left. There might be a few of you still here. Maybe most of them have left. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I mean, the hit dog always barks. So somebody calls Brother Doug this week and says, I'm leaving. He'll know who that was, I guess. I don't know. But there's not a feeling of having to be perfect. Uh, now, there's, there's a reverent respect for what we should be. I'm not, I'm not being flippant about that at all. But I, I believe that in the right way, you come up here with pretty much any problem, and these folks are going to love you and help you. And really not going to care, because I think most of them figured out that we all walk crippled feet. But he says, where's the God of Elijah? Wouldn't you like for the God of Elijah to do what he did here and become the God of Elisha? So wouldn't you like that God that you're always looking that seems to do things for other people to become yours? Not just in salvation, but in practice, in practicality. Instead of constantly looking around and says, well, why is God always good to them? Well, God may always be good with them, but I promise every now and then the transmission goes out, the motor blows up, things happen in life, right? There's more month at the end of the money, that's just like, you know, but God still is good. But the God of Elijah, the God of whoever you're looking at and whoever you're envying has to become your God. Now, practically, is your God based on birth and being born again? 
But then also you're God based on practice after you're born again. God, I'm going to trust you. You know, I, I hate to say this because sometimes when you say things, you end up living them. But one of the most remarkable books in all the Bible is Job. Though he slay me, I will trust him. Now, that's faith, man. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I hope I have that. I hope I never had to see that I have that, right? But sometimes, no, all the time, when you're going through what you're going through, you may be going through it because of your ignorance. You may be going through it because of your sin. But God will bring you through it in the absolute best way possible if you'll let him bring you through it that way. And sometimes you're just going through it to grow. I hate that. But that's just reality. Sometimes God's just teaching you that next week you may be able to teach somebody else. Why does this always happen? Maybe it happens so you can show somebody else where they don't have to skin their knee the way you skint yours. Because maybe if they skin their knee the way you skint your knee, they wouldn't recover the way you recovered because you're just a little bit further along in the path of life in the Christian life than they are. So instead of God, why? God, thank you. And help me get it. Right? Because I don't want to do the class over again. Help me get it. God, thanks. God, thanks for COVID. God, thanks for our election. God, thanks for our government. God, thanks for my health. You know, I mean, it's Debbie over here with a boot on her shoe. Thank God she can't drive. Somebody might be safer, you know. <laughs> but, it's, but it's hard to really be thankful when you think God is the God of somebody else and not yours. But after he got past his doubt... He was able to live his, his dream. Uh, you find lots of amazing things about Elisha. And like I said, he asked for a double portion. And somebody a lot smarter than me said, Elijah did 14, he did 28. So instead of looking back at your hero's God, maybe your hero's God can be more of your God and you could do more now because your hero's done. Elijah was gone. Right? I mean, D.L. Moody's gone. Billy Sunday's gone. Billy Graham's gone. Lots of great preachers that I know are gone. Lots of great missionaries I know are gone. I saw last night there's a little film about George Mueller. George Mueller's gone. David Livingston's gone. But God ain't. Now you think about it, you know, the time that Elisha spent with Elijah, and then all of a sudden... Okay, God's me and you. But that's okay. The God of our grandparents is still God, but our grandparents have gone. One of these days, your dad or your mom are going to be gone. As a young person, God needs to become your God. One of these days. Did you ever make known to God your desires? And I don't care that they're secular. Because God could use a lot of secular people to do a lot of spiritual things. But we all can't just live in a compound. Sometimes it'd be nice. We might end up that way, right? Lots of guns, lots of Bibles, lots of food, you know. Eventually they'll nuke us and we'll get to go to heaven. It'll be okay. I'm just teasing. I'm not advertising a David Crest compound. But when I, when I read this, I, some, either the preacher or somebody preached on this eight or ten weeks ago. And I got to thinking about that thought, where's the Lord of Elijah? And I got to thinking about how often we seem to envy what God's done for everybody else and not appreciate what he's done for us. You know, I look back through my life and I look at the miracles that have brought us to this point. You know, I look back at my life on a cold winter night, 28th of February, 1987. I went to Landmark Independent Baptist Church. I heard a guy named Peter Ruckman draw a message, come for winter. I don't know that I've ever been in church. I don't know that I knew what conviction was. But I knew what the harvest was. 
And I knew what reaping time was because I was a country boy and an old man just drew. And I believe with everything in me, that's the first time in my life I was under conviction. And then, you know, I began to work with a, a guy that had been newly saved and every night he'd witnessed to me. Every night. You know, uh, there's a song, I don't know that many of you know it, but it's called A Walking, Talking Miracle. That's what we are. It's not only what I am. You know, I get over here in the choir, somebody starts singing about God's goodness, and I just get where I can't take it. And I get to where it just breaks me, because I, I know who I am. But God's goodness to usward, not just to me. I don't just have a story, you have a story. I don't just have the God of Elijah. You have the God of Elijah. The reason that we live defeated and not victorious, I really don't get them all. But at least in your heart and your mind, if you don't understand that we are victorious, we're seated in heavenly place in Christ. Seated. Present tense. Right? You know, my friend Rex Harrison used to sing, I'm already over on the other side waiting on my brand new body. See? And we think that God's only a really big God for the others. God's a really big God for us. God's a really big God for you. So whatever the desire you have, whatever thing it is that God's put inside of you that is only put inside of you, trace it. Well, preacher, what's everybody else going to say? Who cares? Well, I got nobody to help me. Well, you got God. And you'll never have nobody to help you if you don't raise your hand and ask what you need help with. Amen. I mean, the reason you don't raise your hand is because you're still doubting. The reason you don't walk up here and grab the preacher's hand and say, would you have the church pray for me? I believe God's calling me to the ministry. I believe God's calling me to the mission field. I believe God's calling Why? Because you have enough doubt and you do fear for what everybody else thinks. And yet this morning, in this room, God once again has stoked a fire in your heart with what he's called you to do. I have no clue what that is, because you haven't told us. But you might be amazed at the support you'd get. I mean, really. You know, sometimes I, I look around and I'm thinking about asking the preacher, preacher, who in the world in the church needs some help? Because sometimes I just got money in my pocket and want to help somebody. Preacher, who's, who's got a desire to do something? How can we help them? And yet God's people don't have enough trust to slap the river Jordan with the mantle that God's given you and say, God, this is what I'm going to do. You will be a lot better off with the church full of people that love you praying for you. The stuff that's happened the last six months here can't happen here without God doing something in the hearts of people. And some of you, and I know I'm meddling right now, but some of you, God's done something in your heart. And God spoke to you in your heart. And you're standing on the banks of the River Jordan with the mantle on your shoulder, doubting. If you'll lay it in the water, if it'll work. As long as you keep the man on your shoulder, and as long as you keep the desire on your shoulder and not get past the doubt, nobody will even never know. You know, the problem is, Sid, I'll tell you what the problem is. I'm just going to preach just to Sid for one minute. You're trying to figure out what 10 years from now looks like. Take it from me, that don't work. Vision is going as far as you see to go and trusting that you'll get when you get there, you'll see to go further. That's what vision is. God's not going to give you the next step until you take this step. I mean, he just, trust me, he's not. And you can whine, cry, lay on the altar, boo-hoo all you want to. But it's called faith. 
God gives us one step at a time. Elijah, Elisha gets the man when he runs down to the river and he says, where's the God of Elijah? Well, let's see. Why? Because he's probably an A-type personality and he wasn't going to wait, right? If you're going to kill me, don't drag me to death. But there's a lot of us in this room that God's given the next step. Problem is, you don't know what step 50 looks like. You never will. I was talking to Brother Sam yesterday morning. Sheila was in Pilates. Thank God I didn't have to go to Pilates. And you know, it, it really is as simple as the little song, Trust and Obey. But there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Faith is just a step of obedience. And a lot of you are not nearly as happy as you could be because you're standing on the River Jordan with the mantle that God's given you, the thing that you've asked for, on your shoulder, and by faith you won't step out. You got a church that loves you. You got people that loves you. You got all kinds of people that God's already touched their heart to help. And they're willing to help. They're looking for where to give, how to give, what to give. And yet you haven't, by faith, taken that step to even show them what the issue is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day and for your goodness and mercy. God, I, I know somebody here, probably more than one somebody, knows what the next step is. God, I pray you give them the courage to, to take the step, but not only to take the step, but to tell somebody about it. Because, God, we're doubtful people. And very few of us can just go our way by ourselves. God, I believe there's been a big movement. I believe, God, the next generation of what you want done is sitting here in this building knowing what the next step is. God, I pray that they would just be obedient simply to the next step. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.